I'll take this moment then to introduce our speaker. Today's speaker is Jamie Walters. Uh, he's currently an NSF postdoctoral fellow at Stanford University. I didn't actually have a chance to ask you whose lab you're based in. Hunter Fraser's lab. In Hunter Fraser's lab. Uh, but he already has a faculty position lined up at University of Kansas. And so he's going to be starting his own lab there in August of 2013, so August of this year. And uh, his general interests are in evolutionary biology, genetics, and genomics. And uh, of course, the current work is with butterflies and uh, with a particular emphasis on understanding the role that sexual selection plays in shaping genetic diversity. So welcome. Thank you very much. Yeah, this is, this is really a, a, a real pleasure to be able to uh, speak to folks here. And, and uh, I've been at Stanford for about a year now and, and feel very fortunate to have had the opportunity to interact with a lot of people at Berkeley already. Um, it's, it's, I feel a real kinship with the, with the group here um, for a lot of reasons. Uh, the, the work that I'm going to be talking to you about really spans um, sort of from my PhD at Cornell. I was in Rick Harrison's lab. I then spent the first two years of my postdoc at the University of Cambridge in England with Chris Jiggins, moved uh, to Stanford University in Hunter Fraser's lab for the, the final year, and then um, in a couple months I'll be moving to the University of Kansas. So the, the work that I'm sharing sort of spans this, this range of institutions and, and collaborators, just, just so that folks know. Uh, the story that I'm going to tell you really starts, I think, in the year 2000. Uh, I, I, I would argue that that really marks a sort of paradigm shift in biology for, for many of us uh, because we entered the era of omics in 2000. Uh, and this was also the year that I graduated from college and started my sort of professional career as a, as a biologist. So it's, it, it, it fits for me in a lot of ways. Now, in the year 2000, if you were doing genomic biology in animals, you were almost certainly working on one of these three organisms. <laughs> and what's happened since then, um, as I know very well pe people here are, are in the midst of, is this explosion of opportunity and resources in a bunch of other organisms where we can do genomic biology. And this, um, for someone like me who's really interested in both organismal biology and uh, sort of genomic biology, presents uh, what I'm considering sort of the genomic revolution 2.0 where this expanding amount of genomic biology presents the opportunity to do what I think of as genomic natural history. I think many people would call it comparative genomics, but you can sort of uh, discover and describe all these really fascinating patterns of biodiversity. But to get at process, you still need to leverage organismal biology. You're using genomic tools, genomic data sets, but at its core is, gen is, is the organismal biology. And this sort of creates a cycle, I think, where you create more data, you have more patterns, you can test more hypotheses, and um, it, may, it cycles, and I think increasingly we all feel like it's cycling out of control. I don't know about that. <laughs> it's how I often feel about it. Um, I uh, focus in Lepidoptera, so moths and butterflies, and just in the last couple of years, we've had a real explosion. So Monarch is a g published genome, Heliconius is a published genome, this genome um, uh, Hel um, sorry, uh, Plodia Twitella, the diamondback moth, was just published in the last 10 or 12 days. And of course, the silkworm Bulbic Mori has been out for a little while. But these other species I know very well have genome projects underway. So we're going to see a lot more Lepidopteran genomes coming out in the next year or two, as with almost every other taxon. Now, um, I, I have uh, a particular interest in sex and sexual selection. And butterflies are really excellent for studying these sorts of questions because they have a well-studied ecology and behavior. Um, there's a lot of parallel with birds in that uh, people are very interested in them broadly, so there's a lot of um, amateur but very good ecologists who, who have developed uh, this rich history of natural, rich depth of natural history in this group of organisms. There's a wide diversity of mating systems, so you have sort of essentially monandrous to highly promiscuous. Uh, they're relatively easily observed in terms of their mating and courtship. And in particular, the males transfer a, a packet of spermatophore to females, which in almost all species persist. And so you can catch a female in the wild, dissect her, and count how many times she's mated. So you can actually have a relatively accurate assessment of female remating from natural populations, um, which is, I think, pretty unusual for many groups of species, for most species. Another interesting aspect about butterflies and a parallel with birds is that they have reverse sex chromosomes. So most people are going to be familiar with your normal XY males and XX females. So males are the heterogametic and females are the homogametic sex. But in butterflies and birds, this is reversed. Males are the homogametic sex and females are the heterogametic sex. And so this reverses the relationship between sex and male-specific sexual selection and heterogamy. 
And so there's you know a wide opportunity of, of a wide range of questions to ask with regards to the molecular evolution of sex chromosomes and sex-linked genes in uh, butterflies. So just very broadly, this for me presents a good opportunity to ask questions about the role of sexual selection and sex-specific selection on the influence of evolution, especially at the molecular level, and in particular the uh, single out sex chromosomes in this process. And so today I'm going to tell you about what was my PhD thesis work, and spend the, the majority of the time on this question about the relationship between sexual selection and reproductive proteins. But then I'm going to also touch on more recent work on the questions of sex chromosome dosage compensation. Uh, and if there's time, I'll give a, a little interlude about the Heliconius Genome Project, which I was uh, deeply involved with during my time at Cambridge. But um, we'll see. I might not be able to fit that in, so we'll see how it goes. This question of reproductive proteins really stems from the observation that uh, proteins that are involved in reproductive processes tend to evolve unusually rapidly. And by that we mean that there's a relatively high level of divergence between species and also a high incidence of positive selection among these group of proteins relative to other sorts of proteins that you might find in your brain or digestive tissue or in muscle or that sort of thing. And this pattern is, exists in a wide range of taxa. It's been documented over and over again now. But what's a bit less well understood, perhaps not well understood at all still, I would argue, is what the major factor is in driving this, uh, this pattern of adaptive and rapid uh, divergence. Now, there have been a handful of hypotheses put forward in the literature. This was a, a really hot topic about 10 years ago when I was really diving into this. Um, but far and away, sexual selection receives the most attention as the obvious explanation. And I agree, it's the most obvious sort of intuitive explanation for what's driving this. Um, but I would also argue that there's been relatively little or few good direct tests of this hypothesis, certainly relative to these other hypotheses that have been put forward. So um, I'm going to focus on this, and most people have, but... Um, I challenge you to think critically when people assume that sexual selection is driving the rapid evolution of reproductive protein, what evidence there really is for that. Now, in particular, for reproductive proteins, we're focused on primarily post-mating sexual selection, so processes like sperm competition and cryptic female choice. Sexual conflict is a major component of this. People often group it in as well. So to, to formulate this a little bit more specifically, we're asking, does post-mating sexual selection influence the, rap the, the rapid evolution and positive selection of reproductive proteins. And I think one promising way to approach this is to compare the evolution across lineages with divergent mating systems. And so what you might want is a system such like this, ideally, where you have a nice contrast in clades, where you have a polyandrous mating system, females mate multiply, there's good opportunity for post-mating sexual selection to influence the reproductive protein evolutionary rates. In contrast, you have a monandrous mating system. Females essentially mate only once or at least much, much less than this group. Uh, and that's going to have relatively weak post-mating sexual selection. Now, uh, I dove into the literature way back when and, and fished around for different systems and landed on this group of Heliconius butterflies. Um, it's a system that's probably most famous for this wide diversity of wing color patterns and um, the mimicry as well between wing color patterns. So different species have convergent wing color patterns. And so there's been a lot of really good work on this. A lot of the uh, investment and development of genomic resources have been focused on this. But there's another interesting aspect of Heliconius butterflies, which is their mating system. There's a, two large clades that correspond to a distinct divergence in mating system. So you have uh, these, what I'm going to call adult mating butterflies. And this is the sort of normal ancestral state. The, female, the males and females mate as fully uh, developed and closed adults. Um, in contrast, in the pupil mating system, which is uh, unique to Heliconius, it's the derived state, females mate while they're still in the chrysalis. And so what you have here is a male who's inserting his abdomen into the mm -hmm. chrysalis to mate with the female here. And it's, uh, it's, it's a pretty remarkable uh, behavior. Now, this is... Um, a nice contrast to mating systems. The common wisdom is that these guys, these guys mate multiply and these guys only mate once. Um, and I'll, I'll speak more on that at, at length. But, but it does uh, present the system that I'm looking for, potentially, to 
study the reproductive proteins. So that's the, that's the organismal system. At the molecular level, I'm going to focus on insect seminal fluid proteins. These are uh, proteins secreted by the male accessory gland of the reproductive tract. They're transferred to females during copulation, and they're known, especially in Drosophila, to have a wide range of effects on female reproductive physiology and behavior. And they're also a classic uh, example of the rapid and adaptive evolution of reproductive proteins. Uh, when I started this work, there had been a, a fair bit of effort uh, characterizing this group of proteins in, uh, in flies and also in honeybees and in crickets, but uh, there had been no work done in Lepidoptera. So a major challenge in this research was to also to identify these proteins in order to study how they're evolving across the mating system. Now, I want to um, speak a little bit more about Heliconia's mating systems. I have a little video here that sort of shows the um, behavior a little bit more uh, interactively. And so what you're seeing here is what I'm going to call the typical adult and butterfly baiting behavior. The males uh, hover and, and sort of waft and present to the females, maybe um, uh, showing, um, um, presenting them with pheromones. There's a lot of chemical ecology that remains to be done in Heliconius. Um, and females uh, sort of choose whether or not they're going to mate with those males. In contrast, in pupil mating, the males uh, search out for the, the pupa, and they actually just hang out on the pupa, on female pupa, and wait until they are just about to close or are closing. And at that point, the males will insert their abdomen or, or, or a couple with the females just as they're coming out. And unfortunately, I don't have any exact video of that, but we can show you uh, the photo here. So, as I said, they sort of will insert their abdomen in and um, continue to copulate as they're uh, coming out of, the, um, out of the chrysalis. And I have to credit my wife, who's actually a filmmaker, with helping me put this little thing together for one of the papers that we published. So, the, as I said, the common wisdom here is that uh, the uh, adult mating females mate multiply, the pupil mating females only mate once, but this is based on, um, well, let me just say that, that the, the data going into this, at least the published data, were, were fairly limited. Um, the, there were sort of relatively small sample sizes, primarily from greenhouse uh, populations, and of course, um, some, a lot of anecdotal reports, which may very well and are, are, are probably accurate, but um, you really want to sort of quantify this as best you can. So how do we actually estimate mating frequencies? Well, there's, there's two ways. I already mentioned spermatophore counts. Uh, another way is in greenhouses just to actually watch the butterflies. And what I've done here is, as an example is to consolidate two unpublished data sets, one from Carol Boggs, who's at Stanford, from her PhD thesis in 1979. And, and this is Heliconia signal, the adult mater. And you can see there's uh, quite a lot of remating that goes on here. Uh, in contrast, Adam Boyko, who many of you know, he, uh, he was from, he um, joined Carlos Bustamante's lab and is now back at California, but he did his PhD, sorry, back to Cornell. He did his PhD in Heliconius butterflies, most people don't know that. And um, he had a bunch, a very large sample of a pupil mater here, and, and again, a, a couple of them mated more than once, but the vast majority mated only once. Although, oddly, a huge number didn't mate at all, which is a, a bit unusual as well. So these are greenhouse experiments, Just things can be a little bit funny in the greenhouse. Um, another thing that, uh, that you can do is count spermatophores, and in this case, when males mate, they transfer um, uh, 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 a sort of a solid mass into the female bursa copulatrix, which is the sac. So this sort of pearly thing here is the bursa copulatrix inside a translucent, uh, sorry, this is the spermatophore inside the bursa copulatrix. And you can dissect that out of female, so this is the bursa copulatrix, and these are the two spermatophores that are inside the female. And so you can go into natural populations, collect females, open them up, and count them. And people have done this from greenhouse uh, populations again, and it does look <coughs> like the common wisdom. There's uh, these people maters apparently only have mated once, whereas the adult maters have mated uh, a couple of times. But again, the greenhouse experiment, relatively small population sizes for the samples. And so, um, you know, the, Likes, we like to know what's going on in natural populations as well. And there's a further complication here that has been largely ignored by these studies, which is that the spermatophores in pupil mating butterflies degrade over time. This was an observation made by Carol Boggs you know, 30 years ago, but has not received a lot of attention. But of course, if the 
if they degrade, if the battle force degrade, counting them is not going to be a very, if they degrade quickly in particular, counting them is not going to be a very good assessment of remaining rates. So uh, I was hoping and had some ideas about how to improve on this or, or generate more information about this to address questions like, can we better quantify the rate of greater de degradation relative to butterfly lifespan? Uh, what are the patterns in natural populations of remaining, both in pupil mating and adult mating butterflies? And can we account for this degradation rate when assessing spermatophore counts, especially in the pupil maters? So to do this, we had to sort of come up with a way of quantifying how uh, the spermatophore degrades. And so after doing a lot of dissections, I sort of came up with these four categories. Uh, this, right after mating, I don't have any photos of this, it's, it's a, like a little <coughs> balloon. It actually looks remarkably like a, a pearl. But then it quite quickly, quickly collapses in and on itself. But I still consider this fresh after mating. And then you can kind of see qualitatively, you end up with this sort of thinning and, and um, lightening and, and then eventually being partially degraded but still intact um, or partly intact. And then here's this oily orange substance that Carol Boggs describes, it just disappears. Now the adult maters, they pretty much stall out right here. You don't get much more degradation than this, so you can't accurately count spermatophores and adult maters. But using this uh, scoring system and controlled greenhouse crosses, uh, with uh, 35 Heliconia serrata butterflies, which you see here doing their thing, um, the, we scored degradation at known ages, and this is what we ended up with. Now, I, I know that the sampling is a little bit wonky here in terms of the, the days um, post-mating. Sometimes living organisms don't live as long as you want, and sometimes undergraduates help that along. Um, <laughs> but but I, I think that there's a couple of important patterns to recognize. First, that this transition from a fresh to sort of empty but intact happens relatively quickly. Um, the second thing is that this empty but intact stage does seem to last quite a long time. Um, you know, and then even the partially degraded ones, you, in, in my data, you have to go out to nearly three weeks before you get a large portion of completely degraded spermatophores. And so that then suggests that you do actually have a pretty wide window in which you can correctly or, or, or actually accurately count the spermatophores as they degrade in Heliconius butterflies. So the other question is, how long do they live? Well, Heliconius are remarkably long-lived for butterflies. In fact, um, mark recapture studies suggest that the, the mean age is about 30 days, which on a type 2 um, survivorship curve means that the median age is about 21 days. Um, they can live as long as four months or longer as well, so, so they are remarkably long-lived. But um, this does suggest that if you have spermatophores that are countable for two to three weeks, and that's you know, about as long or nearly as long as most butterflies are living, then um, it does suggest that remainings in pupil maters would be observed at, at least a good proportion of the time if the pupil maters were remaining. Um, but what's going on in natural populations? Um, one advantage that I think many people here will appreciate is a long, deep collection of organisms taken from the field and kept over time for young people like me to come along and use. And so um, I was very fortunate in going into the collections from uh, Chris Jiggins and Jim Mallet and some of these guys who've been working on Heliconius for quite a long time and dissecting females from these natural cop populations. And so I was able to sample about uh, 10 pupil maters and about 18 adult maters and count the number of spermatophores. And again, a couple of patterns come out here. Um, again, you do occasionally see observed rematings in the pupil maters in natural populations. But in each of these few cases, there was two very fresh spermatophores <coughs> back to back or side by side. So it suggests that these were either two very, two males that sort of mated with a female one after the other, or perhaps uh, one male transferring two spermatophores, though I'm not sure whether that happens. Um, but for the adult maters, the numbers are um, add up to having at least 25% of the, of the sample females remating at least once, and sometimes two and even three times from these natural populations. Um, so it does, I think, point to and support this notion that you have a, a meaningful difference in the remaining rate between the pupil maters and the adult maters in these populations. Now we can do a little bit more with these data because we can stratify them by age. 
and uh, although we know nothing about the absolute ages of these butterflies, you can use the wings that have been collected with these butterflies and score them relatively for age. So of course, this is a very freshly emerged butterfly, and this guy has probably been around for a month or two, right? So, so you can really get in there and, um, and do this. And so I've, I quantified the rate of spermatophore degradation by four categories of wing wear. And what you can see is that in these natural populations, you, you have um, a, ra a, a distinctly in increasing proportion of completely degraded uh, spermatophores here. And especially in the older two wing wear categories, you have almost no, you have no fresh and very few even sort of empty but intact categories. So again, to my eyes, this really does suggest that you have almost no uh, rematings that are happening after uh, very early in life, and that we're still not observing uh, any, any fresh spermatophores out here. So it sort of further supports the fact that females are not mating again. And especially if you contrast this with the pattern that happens in um, one of the pupil mater, sorry, one of the adult maters, Heliconius malpomene. Here you have uh, nearly half of the older females having remated at least once and sometimes two, two times. And so here, where, where in the adult maters you appear to have an increase in the number of rematings as they get older, uh, the, the pupil maters really don't seem to have any additional matings happening out here. So just to sort of tie this all together, the spermatophore uh, count data, I think, suggests that the degradation does not appear to be severely impacting the inferences of remaining rates in Heliconius uh, pupil mating butterflies. And it also supports this common wisdom regarding the differences in the remaining rates between monandry and pupil mating uh, butterflies and suggests that there is uh, a, at least a moderate level of polyandry among the adult mothers. Now at this point, um, I'm keenly aware that I haven't shown you any statistics on any of these uh, data. It's mostly been very qualitative. Um, it's sort of a weird data set to fit statistics to because of the qualitative nature of the data, but I worked uh, closely with a, um, uh, Tom Hardcastle in Cambridge, who's a biostatistician, to develop a sort of novel maximum likelihood regression framework for these qualitative data. And so the results that I've just shown you, the conclusions, are supported by a fairly sophisticated um, uh, statistical framework. I'm just going to leave it at that. If you want to ask questions, I'm happy to talk about it more. But, but the data are there, the, the stats are there in, in, in this publication as well. <coughs> but um, the, the whole point of this exercise really was to say, to, 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 to convince you that we do have a difference in mating systems here between the adult mating and the pupil mating butterflies, which are going to be informative around differences in evolutionary rates if we observe them for reproductive proteins. So moving on to this question of seminal fluid proteins, we've gotten to know the butterflies pretty well. We need to know something more about the butterflies' proteins. And to do this, um, there are sort of three steps that I'm going to share with you. Um, we have to identify the seminal fluid proteins in Heliconius butterflies, establish a pattern of rapid and adaptive, adaptive evolution among those uh, proteins, because if we don't see this, testing for differences between mating systems isn't really going to tell us very much about what's driving this pattern. So um, started off by making a, a Sanger-based EST library. Again, this was, you know, I don't think any of us had heard the word Illumina when, when, when these research plans were um, started. And we took a representative Heliconius errato pupil mater and Heliconius malpomene adult mating. These are the two most well-studied groups in the two clades, which means that there's going to be additional uh, wing-related genomic resources which support this effort. And uh, we ended up with about 350 uh, different ESTs. And, and uh, it's almost sort of, <laughs> it's, it's really pretty funny now because, you know, anyone would, these days would throw 454 or Illumina at this and you'd have, you'd be swimming in data. But, but at the time, 300 loci seemed like a lot for me to deal with. Um, but in any case, uh, having these loci still doesn't know that we know exactly what they're doing, that they are seminal fluid proteins. We need to sort of further analyze these. So, so which of these are encoding seminal fluid proteins? And to do this, I used a combination of sort of expression data, so went into the wet lab and assessed using PCR whether these proteins were uniquely or primarily expressed in the accessory glands as opposed to uh, female tissue or male thorax. <coughs> and also looked, um, used bioinformatic methods, which predicted uh, a signal peptide, which is an, um, a signal of extracellular secretion. So this combination of being expressed in the, seminal, uh, sorry, in the accessory glands and extracellularly secreted 
yielded uh, 46 uh, seminal putative seminal fluid proteins. Now, this method is um, re somewhat indirect, right? We sort of look, what we'd like to be able to do is actually look inside the spermatophores and try to detect the proteins that are transferred to the females in the spermatophores. It turns out that you can do this using um, what I'm going to call shotgun proteomic techniques. And this was done in collaboration with a proteomics core at the University of British Columbia. The idea is that you can take uh, freshly mated butterflies, dissect out the spermatophore, you then uh, extract the proteins, separate it out from the sperm through centrifugation, and chop those proteins up and send them through a mass spec device, which give you your mass spectra. At the same time, we have this library, or, or in this case, sort of uh, ultimately now we're going to be using full genomic data sets, and you can match the mass spectra that come off of this to predicted mass spectra from your um, in silico digested genomic library. And when you have matches between your proteins and the mass spectra data, that's evidence that the, the proteins are directly in that sample. And so we applied this to the butterflies, in this case the seminal fluid proteins in butterflies, and ended up identifying 23 seminal fluid proteins from that library proteomically um, with substantial overlap between the, the indirectly identified proteins from the expression and uh, secretion <coughs> data. And at the same time, there was substantial overlap between Heliconia serrata and Heliconia melpomene as well. And so I think together, putting these data together really leaves, leaves me feeling like I've actually done a reasonable job of, of identifying seminal fluid proteins in these butterflies with which to study the reproductive, sorry, rates of evolution. Just to touch base simply on, on, on what they are, overwhelmingly they were actually unknown, which is to say I could not really identify any predicted function. But there were a lot of um, protease and protease inhibitors and a handful of other uh, classes that are also pretty common in other seminal fluid proteins, both in mammals and in insects. So there's sort of an emerging sense that um, despite the rapid turnover in the actual proteins that are there, the functional classes are surprisingly conserved across uh, different taxa in the seminal fluid proteins. So now we need to look at patterns of evolution among these, uh, among these proteins. And I'll do a little um, sort of uh, introduction to, to assessing these. I know this is very familiar to a lot of people, um, but just so we're all on the same page, we're talking about having a, a DNA alignment for coding sequence between two species. And those changes at the DNA level may not cause any changes in the encoded amino acid. So these are going to be silent. And uh, the rate of those is the DS rate. And of course, then you can have um, changes at the, um, in the DNA which do encode a different amino acid. And these are going to be non-synonymous. And if you take the ratio between these two, then that's a measure of the functional rate of evolution, which is often just symbolized as omega. And that omega value, uh, if it's higher, means you have more rapid evolution. If it's lower, then it's more, it's, the evolution is slower. But it also gives you an idea of sort of the evolutionary pressures uh, being experienced by that gene. So an omega value that's statistically greater than 1 is evidence for recent positive selection, whereas uh, values approaching 1 but not at 1 mean that there's relaxed constraint, that natural selection and, and neutral evolution are essentially acting at about the same rate. Um, and when you have... Um, omega close to zero, then it's indicated a purifying solution. So now with this, sort of, with this statistic, we can re-address re the question of rapid evolution. So we're actually asking, looking for a difference in the relative rates of uh, evolution as measured by the omega value. And then um, for adaptive evolution, we can ask, is there evidence for omega being greater than one for these proteins? And so as a comparison, I made use of the wing data. There were, um, uh, again, pretty substantial Sanger EST libraries for these two species, for Heliconia sumaria and Heliconia malpomene. And at the time, this yielded uh, 360 control proteins, which we could compare to the seminal fluid proteins. And when you look at the evolutionary rates between this sort of class of, of control proteins and seminal fluid proteins, there's a whopping difference. The, 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 there is substantial evidence for rapid evolution among these proteins and all these butterflies. So we do see what we were expecting on this front, but what about omega being greater than 1? 
it turns out that comparing uh, just two species like this is not a very powerful test for adaptive evolution. Um, you're averaging across the entire genome, or sorry, averaging across the entire gene, um, and it does not have a lot of power. At the same time, it's also not going to be very informative for differences between mating systems, right? We've got two different mating systems represented. We need to sample within them to be able to compare between them. So you need a lot more taxa to use these methods. And so for, it, and you end up with a lot more power when you can go codon by codon. So in some codons are going to be completely conserved. Some codons are going to be evolving adaptively and have a very high omega value. Other codons are, codons are going to be somewhat constrained, but not perfectly constrained. And so when you go codon by codon like this, there are specific models that allow you to test evolution at the codon site level. At the same time, we can uh, split the phylogeny into two groups and ask about evolutionary rates between the different groups. So these branch models would allow me to test for relative rates between um, the pupil maters and the adult maters. And, um, but, but doing this needs a bunch more species, right? I only got my two species, I need a bunch more. And this is where I was fortunate enough to be invited on some collecting expeditions in Panama and Peru, and so I got to go out into the jungle, which was really a great opportunity. Uh, it came home with uh, a, a bunch more species, which I could plug into this phylogeny. So I've got uh, now a half dozen adult mating and pupil mating butterflies, which we can then um, test for differences between adult and pupil mating, and also for the incidence of adaptive evolution. So uh, to do this, I had to reduce the number of loci I was looking at because I was generating these sequences by hand. Um, and, but I did select all of the, uh, the, the, the proteomically detected loci. And then um, what seems now an almost embarrassingly modest selection of control genes, but um, that's what I had to work with. And when we tested for adaptive evolution, none of the control genes showed omegas greater than one, but two of the seminal fluid proteins uh, did show uh, evidence for adaptive evolution. So uh, to, together here, we've now established a pattern of, of rapid and at least occasional adaptive evolution among seminal fluid proteins. And it's time to move on to look for differences in the mating system of these, um, of these proteins. And so <clears throat> what we're specifically asking is, if post-mating sexual selection is driving the rapid and adaptive evolution of reproductive proteins, we're going to expect to see um, more adaptation and more rapid divergence among the adult maters relative to the pupil maters. So there are a couple of ways that I went about trying to localize where, adap where the adaptive evolution is going on. First, qualitatively by using site models and we could sort of predict at which amino acids we were observing adaptive evolution and then looking at the phylogeny, where are those changes happening? Do they concentrate more in one part of the phylogeny or the other? And there are actually formal models that combine branch and site methods to actually test this specifically. And so uh, to give you one example, what you're looking at here is um, the, the phylogeny with the total number of amino acid substitutions on each branch, and then in parentheses, uh, how many of those, um, how many of the three identified adaptively evolving <coughs> codons were changing in that lineage. And the branches in red are where you have changes in the adaptively evolving codons. And the pattern is that you end up with a bunch more red in the adult maters than in the pupil maters, and even um, a higher number of, so you have two, two, three here, whereas for the pupil maters, it's always just sort of one if it happens. So this qualitatively looks like there's a concentration of adaptation going on more in the adult maters than in the pupil maters. And indeed, for this locus at least, the branch site model confirms this qualitative result. You do see um, statistical evidence for adaptation going on in this clade over this clade. Um, it's not true for the other protein in which we detected adaptive evolution. So, what do we say? There does seem to be some, some evidence for increased adaptation among adult maters relative to pupil maters, but I will be the first to admit, it's only a couple of loci. It's not a really screaming result. What about sort of average levels of, of evolutionary rate? In this case, we're using branch models to test for a single omega shared across the phylogeny versus two different omega values uh, estimated for the adult mater and the pupil mater. We're going to test whether this model fits better than this model. And uh, so we, for each locus, fit the null and alternative hypotheses with maximum likelihood, going locus by locus, and then uh, 
calculated the likelihood ratio test statistic for the two different models, sum that across the different loci to get a global inference, because what we're really interested in here is sort of an inference that goes across loci. And then you can compare this to a chi-squared um, distribution where the degrees of freedom are equal to the number of loci combined. And um, when we did this, we ended up with a significant effect for the seminal fluid proteins, but not for the control loci. Um, there is a complication here, though, because we're not testing whether one or the other is greater. We're just testing whether or not they're not equal, which is sort of it, um, uh, a constraint of the method. And when you look across loci, you get a result that is uh, not what I was anticipating. Uh, I was expecting for the adult mators to be faster, sexual selection and all. But in fact, the majority of the loci show that you have more rapid evolution among the pupil mating uh, loci. I'm uh, sorry, butterflies. And so to sort of really try and formalize this a little bit more, we came up with a post hoc one-tailed test uh, based on simulations that allowed us to test a one-tailed distribution of whether or not the omega values were greater for pupil maters rather than for adult maters. And when you do that, you do, again, sort of see that you have um, the observed data being way off, way off the scale compared to what you'd expect over the null distribution, uh, which I think speaks to the question that um, we really do see more rapid evolution among the pupil meters. And so to put this together, you, you, you see some weak evidence for adaptive evolution, but in fact, the pattern seems to be opposite for a general pattern of rapid evolution. And this suggests a decoupling of a rapid and adaptive evolution among this group of proteins. And I think raises the question that post-mating sexual selection is not an entirely sufficient explanation for this broad pattern of rapid and adaptive evolution we see among reproductive proteins across many taxa, at least maybe not in this case. So it brings us back to the question of what's going on here. I mean, I have to admit, I, this was not the result that I was expecting. I was expecting a nice hooray sexual selection, that's the answer, right? Um, and the, the, I'm going to suggest another possibility that we may be underestimating the role that relaxed constraint may play, especially in transitions and mating systems. So imagine a situation where you have um, a recent shift in mating systems like we have from the adult mating system to the pupil mating system. You're going to have um, perhaps more rapid evolution due to relaxed constraint in the derived mating system, at least for a while after that transition, but you still have ongoing um, adaptive evolution due to sexual selection, which could be relatively independent of the constraint that, or the reduced constraint that's going on here. So, so that's uh, the best explanation I have for you for, for what may be going on here. Um, research is messy, data sometimes don't quite work out the way that you want. Um, but, but that's the story that I'm going to leave you with right now. And I'm going to spend just a couple of minutes touching on some of the um, other ideas. Of course, moving out here, uh, we want to be able to replicate this in other taxa. This is only a single, a single um, taxonomic contrast or evolutionary contrast that we have, we really want, to, want to do this in many other taxa. And um, also want to look at this in additional proteins, the other reproductive proteins besides just these seminal fluid proteins. And now that we've got uh, genomic re references sequences, there's going to be a lot more opportunity to do this. And um, there's some other interesting biology in Lepidoptera that I think lend themselves to combining these proteomic, proteomic analyses and evolutionary genomic analyses together. In particular, sperm heteromorphism in Lepidoptera is, is really peculiar. Um, almost all LEPs produce normal eupyrene sperm that identify, that, that fertilize eggs, and a lot, sometimes overwhelmingly, <coughs> amount of apyrene sperm, which can't fertilize eggs, but nonetheless do appear to be necessary both for um, the process of fertilization. They also seem to play a role in sperm competition. And so I'm collaborating with Steve Doris here, um, who currently just moved to Syracuse University, to try to use proteomics to look at the molecular complement of apyrene and eupyrene sperm, assess functionally what's going on through a different, both sort of experimental approaches and also comparative genomics, to try and get at the function and uh, fertilization of, oh, sorry, the function of, of these apyrene sperm. So, uh, I don't have any results really, we've just sort of started down this road. We have some preliminary results, but nothing really worth sharing. Um, I do want to sort of highlight another peculiar aspect of Heliconius biology that I think lends itself to this sort of proteomic approach to get at interesting evolutionary genes. Heliconius butterflies 
um, collect pollen and eat pollen. Now, most butterflies, including heliconias, also collect um, nectar. They, they, they consume sugar, but heliconias are unique in, in collecting this pollen and then they, they excrete um, a saliva in which to digest this and they sort of um, uh, sort of curl their proboscis. And this is a novel source of, um, of dietary amino acids, which I think explains in large part their extreme longevity and also the long uh, long-term reproductive investment in females who continue to develop and lay eggs throughout their entire life. And so, again, I've got just a little video that sort of shows this behavior, um, oops, which is fun. So here you can see just that wad of pollen right on the butterfly's mouth, and then this is the, uh, the sort of curling behavior as well. And so it turns out that you can um, trick the butterflies using sort of pollen-sized microscopic glass beads to get them to salivate, and then with a little pipette and nippy tube, you can rinse it in. Um, and I've done a preliminary proteomic analysis of this, and you get, not surprisingly, fructosidases, because they drink nectar, and proteinases, because they're digest digesting the pollen. And so my goal here in the long term is to really try and, and, and get at the proteins that are novel within this butterfly saliva and see if we can say something about the sort of evolutionary basis of morphological, behavioral, physiological novelties, which this very much is for heliconius butterflies. Um, time has gone very quickly. Um, and I think in the interest of time and making sure that everyone gets out of their class, I'm actually not going to talk about the dosage compensation six chromosome story that I have. Um, so I apologize for that. Um, but I think that's probably the more conservative uh, way to go. And I'm going to just end it here. Uh, thank you very much for um, your interest. I do, however, want to make a plug because Sanal asked me to do that. I'm going to skip way through here and just say something about the Heliconius Genome Project, which I was involved with. Uh, the Heliconius Genome Project was a, a wide uh, collaboration across a whole bunch of different uh, individuals, uh, collaborating with, Hel um, with Baylor and also with the European Bioinformatics Institute. There was, um, well, it's a lot of details about genome sequencing. Uh, about 25% of the genome is uh, transposable elements, um, and we were able to map about 85% of the scaffold to chromosomes, which um, really uh, is, is excellent. And, um, oops gives us the opportunity to say that there is a remarkable level of conservation among Lepidoptera um, in terms of their chromosomal organization. And so for questions about sex chromosome dosage compensation and the evolution of sex chromosomes, this is really uh, a good advantage because you don't have genes um, and chromosomes rearranging themselves all over the place. I also want to make a plug for the sort of major story that came out of this effort, um, which is uh, a sort of remarkable story about changes in, um, not changes, but rather shared genetic basis between species of the genetic um, underpinnings of the wing color pattern. And this was, this was work that was mostly from the co-author Das Mopatra, uh, Kanchan. Um, I was involved with the sort of the, the genome biology aspect of it. That was my contribution. But if, for those of you, and I know there many are here, are interested in hybrid zones and the genetic basis of uh, adaptive traits, this is a really interesting story. And so I um, just I want to leave you with that. I'm going to go ahead and jump ahead to my um, very end here. My questions. Oops. No, anyways, it's the end. <laughs> Thank you very much for your attention. Questions for Jamie? In any way, I mean by that, or in, the, in their location, are they in, the, in different chromosomes? In the genome? Yeah. Um, so one, one thing I have not had to do in a, in this is, is have a chance to take the pre-genomic data on seminal fluid proteins and look at where they are in the genome. 
I really want to do that. There's, there was one group of really interesting proteins that seem to be highly repetitive, highly abundant. I think they are the structural components of the spermatophore. They seem to be radically diverged between the two species, um, which is very interesting given that the spermatophore is degraded and not in the other. But they, they, I don't know what's going on in terms of gene family or something like that. With the ESD library, I couldn't get at them at all. So it's, when I start my lab, that's going to be one of my like, pet projects for undergraduates. But I don't know where they are in the genome right now. It's a good question, yeah. Well, following up on that, is there anything to be said about the actual function of these proteins? Are they degrading proteins? Are they interacting with competitor sperm? Or what, what's the role of these proteins? The seminal fluid proteins? Yeah. That's a whole other branch of research that would be really nice to do. Um, most of the work that we know about is from Drosophila. Um, there is one seminal fluid protein known from Drosophila which um, it elicits a, a, what's called the post mating response where females start laying eggs um, and they've been able to take a synthetic version of that protein, uh, inject it into a moth and it has the same effect in moths. She basically uh, stops displaying and emitting her pheromone and switches it. So there, there's, there's clearly an effect on uh, female reproductive phys physiology. Um, they also seem to play a role in influencing the outcome of sperm competition so there's probably something going on there as well. Um, uh, a lot of protease and protease inhibitors, so there does seem to be a lot of catalysis going on okay. as well. But based on the on the genomic analysis, do they seem to belong to the same family, or they're completely divergent? I mean, is there, uh, with, you mean within species or between species? With, within species. With, uh, within the species. Are they? Are they? Are they oh, there's a lot of pyrology, pyrologies, yes. No, there does not seem to be a lot of pyrology, as far as I can tell. No, they, uh, I was afraid that that was going to be a problem going into this, because when you try to do comparative genomics and you end up with a bunch of pyrology, pyrology it's kind of a mess. But it didn't seem to be a problem in this data set. Yeah. Um, I wondering how you see uh, sexual selection affecting the genetic diversity of the Um, there is huge pre-mating sexual selection in the pupil maters. So, so males actually will, um, in natural populations, will actually sort of cluster around p female pupae and fight to get a position. And they've clearly shown that larger males have an advantage in that, in that case. Um, but um, post-mating, post it seems to be a bit more limited, uh, of course. Yeah. So for the pupil maters, male doesn't find uh, emerging female, yeah. will that female mate after um, she's just fully emerged and the mating pattern's different? And if that is the case. We, we, we only, there, there is definitely a debate in the Heliconius community about the extent to which um, people maters will mate as adults. In greenhouses, some species tend, will do that, or, or maybe even regularly do that, um, but it's also true, Darrell, isn't it true that after about a day or two, the females just won't mate. Almost all, most, both groups, immediately after mating, yeah. will refuse to mate. The yeah. females refuse to mate. And so the question is, what brings them back into um, receptivity? And you show that quick degradation in the uh, pupil maters. It's kind of interesting. Yeah. But, but, the, um, but the question is, if they don't mate as pupil maters, um, I, I think that the pupil maters at least in greenhouse populations, if they don't mate in the first day or two after they've been closed, they basically don't, don't mate. We had several females who emerged in our greenhouse experiments that didn't mate, and we left them with males, and they just didn't mate. So it seems like they sort of lose interest, I guess. Yeah? Between the pupil mating and the adult maters, is there a difference in male um, maturity rate or emergence time, or are they breeding into generations? Uh, yeah, the, the, the generations are pretty much ongoing because they're tropical, so there isn't much seasonality to them coming out. So, so in terms of, um, oh, pro, protandry, is that the word? You have, I've forgotten I've forgot the word. When, when, you, when you have males come out before females, um, there doesn't seem to be, uh, a, sort of not a relevant question for these populations because the, the populations are so continuous. Any further questions? All right, let's thank Jamie again for an excellent talk.